Now 250 thousand. Now I'm gonna get 275. Five, I'm gonna get 275. Three. Now 300 thousand. Now three and a quarter. 325. Five, I'm gonna get three and a quarter. I'm gonna get 325. Now half. Now I'm gonna get 300. And good morning from Dallas, Texas, at Lincoln Center at the uh, intersection of the Dallas North Tollway and LBJ Freeway. Uh, welcome to the Mike McGavel Jones Show. And I am uh, very honored and excited to have uh, our Texas Agriculture Commissioner, Mr. Sid Miller. And good morning. Good, good morning to you, Sid. Good morning. Good to be with you. Glad to have you with me. Um, we've got a lot of stuff we're going to talk about. And uh, you're a busy guy. We've been, we've been working on this for probably two or three months trying to get this work we have. done. Maybe longer. We, it, it's took a while, but we've, we're here and we're ready to go. We are. We are. Well, we're thrilled that you're here. Uh, we have a little history, and I'll just just mention it. Uh, we met uh, several years ago. You were helping us um, with the Texas Auctioneers Association. We had some legislation down in Austin. And... Uh, you were uh, very helpful in, in helping the auctioneers. And of course, anytime you're helping the auctioneers, you're a friend of mine anyway, right there. <laughs> and so we've got, we have a lot of folks in the auction industry from here. I can tell you, we've got people in Ireland that'll be watching this. We got South Africa right. watching wow. this. So we're wow. covering a lot of territory. Um, you have quite a distinguished background in multiple areas. Um, I understand you were, you were born in De Leon, Texas, just west of Fort Worth. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna let you tell me a little bit about your your childhood and kind of how that all was. Well, I you know I'm an eighth generation uh, farm and rancher, and so we've been at this since 1700. You know, if we have a couple more good years, we may get the place paid for, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I grew up on the Leon River, uh, uh, north of town in Comanche County, and and uh, we raised uh, crops, peanuts. We had cattle raised American quarter horses, uh, raised hogs. Uh, you know, I learned to hunt and fish on the, on Flat Creek. Uh, matter of fact, that's where uh, my older brother and dad took me down and taught me how to swim. Well, they took me down to the blue hole, Mike, uh -huh. and they, they just picked me up and threw me in the deep end. So <laughs> learning to swim was the easy part. Getting out of the tow sack was the hard part. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a John Wayne yeah. story. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So now, uh, so your family's been in the business all these years. So yeah. when I say, what did your daddy do? It's not hard to figure out because right. you, you were born into it. We were born into it. We came to actually in Virginia in 1700. Wow. And that's when we started. That's, so. that's impressive. And so uh, so when, did, when did your family come to Texas? After the Civil War, uh, we we moved to Texas, so we've been there four, four generations. Wow, farming and ranching in Texas. So, so you uh, you lived there as a kid, and then uh, when you when you got out of high school, then uh, well, did you have any brothers and sisters? I have two brothers and two sisters, so five five of us. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm the second second child, and uh, graduated Tarleton State University, and uh, was an ag teacher actually. Wow, taught uh, vocational ag culture, little 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 town called Gustine there in Comanche County. Very small. 300 people. Yep. One flashing light. Yeah, I'm surprised there was a light. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've done a lot of business down in that part of the country over the years between, oh, uh, between De Leon and Stephenville yeah. and, and all, every little town. I mean, there's not any road down there. I don't think I've been on it one time or another. And uh, I love that part of Texas. Because, and there's a lot of people haven't discovered it yet. You know, they're it's expanding so fast to the north and it's already gone towards the east and now they're getting down around cedar creek and and uh everything south of here down to say venus oh, but yeah. i noticed uh i'm getting a lot of uh information out of granbury and stephenville and brownwood right. and and um but anyway that whole area is growing and people are trying to get away from the city they are and it's it's still you know it's an hour and 15 minutes to fort worth from from my farm and ranch now is in stephenville so we've been there since 1985. is that right yeah so how many acres do you have down there you know i, I farm about 1200 acres yeah uh, there in and around town some of its own some of its lease property so how much time do you spend in austin actually well there's or no, on the road there's no normal okay everybody asks me that there's yeah. no normal so you know, I, I might be in my Austin office three days, one week, and I may not be there for two weeks. And I may, all next week I'll be in Washington, D.C. And, you know, this week I was in El Paso, and I've been in uh, Dallas today, and I was in Abilene yesterday, and be in Austin in the morning, and in San Antonio Saturday, and then on a flight to D.C. Sunday. So, yeah. 
it's just you sound like uh, an auctioneer. Yeah, it's just uh, <laughs> there, there, there's no normal pattern. Yeah, you know we yeah. ha- we actually have a, a second home. I had to buy another home in Travis County, mm-hmm. out in the cornfield, not downtown. Right. So we're out east of town in in the Blackland Prairie out there where they farm a lot of cotton and I know corn. that area real well. Yeah. What's it clo- What's it closest Little to? Little town called Copeland. Copeland. They have a dance hall there, and that's about it. That's all there is. So we're between Taylor and Maynor and Elgin. Well, and, and, you know, I've had sales in every one of those little towns. Oh, but, yeah. You know, back in the 80s, you know, I, I traveled a lot to do sales, selling stores and stuff. Oh, yeah. And we talked about Western Auto Stores. Sure. And you know the folks that had the Western Auto Store and De Leon. Oh, yes. Uh, the Vons. And we've got mutual friends. And and um, it's really funny. The, the, you know, they came up with six degrees of separation a while back. You know, they said, you know, there's six degrees. Well, there's not six degrees. I'm finding it's one and two because I can talk to you for 15 minutes. We can come up with several people we know. Oh, absolutely. It, it's pretty wild. Absolutely. So you finish high school and you go off to college. And uh, I was reading about uh, Associate of Arts degree at uh, Cisco. Right. The booming metropolis of Cisco uh, and Tarleton. And then when did you get married? You know, we, we, my wife and I got married uh, when we were juniors in college. Mm-hmm. So Deborah, met, Deborah met my high school sweetheart at the area FFA banquet <laughs> uh, when we were in high school. So yeah. we, we dated and then been married uh, forty-one years. Be forty-two in June. Well, congratulations! Yeah. I. Um, I, I, FFA was on my list of things to talk yeah. about, and, and since you were a vocational education uh, instructor uh, with the Ag Department, you probably spent a lot of time dealing with FFA and 4-H and all that. Well, you know, I was a, a FFA advisor, obviously, mm-hmm. and a 4-H leader, and, you know, I travel all over this state, just just like you do. And I like to tell everybody, everywhere I go, the greatest natural we, resource we have in Texas is our youth uh-huh. so those kids in those blue jackets and those green jackets yep. they're they're our future they're our future leaders yep and ffa is where leadership is actually taught in our high school the only place it's taught yeah so i have great respect for those so we make pathways for those young people in agriculture any any way we can we make it as uh, easy as possible for them to if they want a career in agriculture we we try to make that happen well you know we were before the interview uh we were talking about uh, fort worth and the stock show and and that goes back to for me when i was 20 22 years old i was covering the ffa at the fort worth stock show for gainesville yeah. uh cook county uh ffa and uh in fact the ffa as ironically i won i won the broadcast award that year for my coverage oh, from wow. being with the ffa and then here we are you know 40 years later and uh off and on for about five to ten years i did the alumni auction at the national convention for ffa oh wow. so they have a you know they have sure. a big uh, uh a big alumni deal and we've we've had a booth at the national i'm a huge fan of fa ffa i just think uh, when you meet those kids they're they're the salt of the earth they are they they just like you said they are the natural resource uh and when you watch those kids talk and give speeches and they talk about leadership and community and business and uh, they soak it in one, one of the neat things that that, that i've done that's this is kind of unique i've i've been uh, sworn in twice now as the texas agriculture commissioner the first time and the last time i opened the had the state ffa officers come and open the swearing in ceremony like they do a chapter conducting team nice. and and close it up every, every every officer at his station here by the plow here by the owl why by the owl all of that yep. and uh, uh actually had grown men come up to me crying saying what fond memories that brought back of their childhood and oh, how yeah. ffa shaped their lives so it was it's, it was a great event it was it's a um well and it's a bonding piece <clears throat> you know uh, of course you and i were talking i ran my own company here in in dallas for 27 years before i joined united country real estate well united country is a huge supporter of ffa and um you know when when they came to me and said hey start start an auction division you know i'd had two or three people say they want to do that with some of the national real estate companies and i go and i looked at these companies i'm going now what what is killer and then i'm not knocking any other real estate company i'm just saying let's say xyz could be keller williams colwell bank or anybody it doesn't matter any national franchise and i'm going where's the where is the rural connection where's how's that going to work and the only franchise company that i could come up with that had a natural auction platform was united country 
because it was built on rural America. There you go. And so I'm sitting there going, why would I, after 27 years of running my own company, why would I go jump on the train with somebody? And I'm sitting there going, well, they, they have FFA, they sell their cattle at auction, they sell their, their equipment at auction, they buy and sell their equipment. A lot of them have bought their farms and ranches at auction. That's true. Uh, this is where I need to go. And that's, and that's why yeah. I joined United Country was because of that connection. And, and I see it all the time with these kids too, oh, yeah. you know, all, uh, with these different FFA chapters and 4-H too. And I've gone to a lot of their, their chapters and, and uh, done a little uh, auction school deal with them where we oh, do tongue perfect. twisters and get them to have some fun. Um, tell me how you got into the politics thing. How did this happen? Well, it was never part of my plan, I'll tell you that for sure. I mean, I had a long-range plan. I had a business wasn't paid for, you know, and several businesses going on, and I was actually recruited. Uh, the vice chairman of the state party, a man named David Barton, came up to me and poked me in the chest one day and said, you're Sid Miller. I said, yes, sir. He said, we want you to run for the House of Representatives. You're going to knock me over with a feather. So anything we went home talked to my family about it we prayed about it and felt that something the lord was leading me to do so you don't argue with him so i was all in and i ran against an incumbent democrat mm -hmm. in a democrat district uh had no chance of winning but my <laughs> wife and i knocked on twelve thousand doors and we actually won yeah. and uh, defeated the incumbent you wanted to win oh yeah i'm you were all, all in. in. I was all if you're in. in, you're in. That's that's just my makeup. What kind of businesses besides the ag business were you involved in before you got into to running for the house? Well, it's it's kind of kind of unusual because I'd, I'd been in lots of them. I'd raised uh, registered hog operations, sheep, goats, cattle, mm -hmm. farm peanuts. You know, I'd farm watermelons and pecans and cantaloupes and just about every milo and sorghum and done all of that uh my main business was i had a 120 acre tree farm and nursery had a couple of retail garden centers had a couple of gift stores really uh you know were they down there in stephenville and brownwood mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so uh yeah, had a nut company where we sold you know uh, gift items cons and uh uh, peanuts and so and, you were growing all that around there yeah because i know san Saba's always real, been real big, big on pecans yeah, they were, you know we got a lot of our uh supplies from down around san Saba. sure yeah. did yeah um so and i as you know and i we talked about this and people that watch this show they know that i, I do a little research on everybody yeah. i like to, i like to know everything i can and also knowing that some of it may not even be true. I mean, you know, I <laughs> oh, mean, yeah. I, we've heard of fake news. <laughs> I, I have. I certainly have. <laughs> um, but anyway, so you, you defeat the, the Democratic um, uh, lawmaker that had been in there, and you weren't supposed to win, but you did. Was it tight or was it close? I mean, what was the margin? It, I think I won that first election like 54-46, so it wasn't really that close. Mm -hmm. wasn't that close. Yep. And of course, he came back and – ran against me and the Democrats came after me for the next four or five elections. And finally that district down there, like many country districts, uh, switched to Republican. Mm -hmm. And so finally the Democrats gave up. Have you always been a Republican? I have. Yes, sir. Always. Yep. yep. Um, when you get into the house, um, what, what, was there any culture shock when you got there, or had you been there enough where you already knew pretty much what was going on? Well, you know, the, 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 thing, the funny thing about the makeup of the legislature down there, about half the, half the people are lawyers and the other half are rich, and I wasn't either one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I was just a country hayseed, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, uh, but I got in there and mixed it up with them. I did okay. Yeah, yeah, well, I can understand that. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a gift. So when you got there, and I was looking at some of the bills that you supported and, and, and introduced and things of that yeah. nature. So when you first got in, kind of what were, what was your focus when you came in? So rather than me try to read a bunch of stuff to you about what you did, why don't you just tell me kind of what your focus and your interests <laughs> well, were of course, when you got there? Agriculture issues. I ended up chairing the Agriculture and Livestock Committee. Uh, also, later I chaired the Homeland Security and Public Safety, where I had oversight over the DPS and Texas Rangers, securing the Texas border and th things like that. Uh, I guess the, the two things that I was really known for is the pro-life leader in the House. Mm -hmm. That that was my issue, and uh, and I this was, was like, in 2011, right? And I was also the ag culture guy. Anything okay. ag culture, you know, that's kind of what I was known for. So, two main pieces of legislation. On the pro-life, the best bill I ever passed was called the sonogram bill, uh, which mm -hmm. 
saves about fifteen to twenty thousand babies in Texas alone each year. Fifteen to twenty thousand. So, mo- most proud of that. And then on the agriculture end, I, I, I waged war on feral hogs. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they they create five hundred million dollars each year damage to our state. Right. So uh, I passed a bill to allow Texans to hunt wild hogs out of helicopters. I was going to bring so, <laughs> that up. That's going to bring so I'm, that up. I'm kind of. I was kind of known as the guy that saved the babies and killed the hogs. That was. <laughs> 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 well, of course, <clears throat> those of us in the auction profession, uh, we know a guy named Craig Meyer, and uh, Craig Craig is an auctioneer uh, from down around Ennis, and and I think he's he's probably ranching 800 to 1,000 acres down there. Well, he got he got all interested in in doing the the helicopter hunt. Oh wow! And so that it even had a TV show. He got into that. Oh, I Hella remember hunters. that. Yes, Hella yeah, I remember hunters. that. Well, <clears throat> Craig came to my auction school in 1998, and he was 18 years old, and he yeah, was I know he, him. he was from Stephenville. He would live down yeah. in Stephenville, and he he was something else. I mean, he was a handful, and so. Anyway, we we kind of took him under our wing and then got him through the auction school. He had a little chant. His daddy was kind of working with him to become an auctioneer, and he came came into the school and and uh, he said, "You're going to be proud of my boy." And I said, well, "Okay, let's hear it." And he did it. And, and I said, "Well, that ain't going to work." <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> got to change that. Craig will appreciate this story. He tells it all the time, and 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 so uh, he was 18 at the time and. Uh, came out and immediately went to he 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 helped me with auctions. I put him put him on the microphone and that, that really made him set up sales. That's how you really get started in auction business is setting up sales. And then I was in the room in in Norfolk, Virginia, at a national convention the night that he met his wife Angie. Mm. She's an auctioneer. Oh, wow. They're both uh, state champion auctioneers here in Texas. Uh, he is past president of the Texas Auctioneer Association. And he's a world champion auto auctioneer. And then they went won the team championship. And ironically, I was in Denver. Colorado doing a St. Jude auction and went out to the uh, went out to the championship and there they win the thing. So it seems like wow. everything that's happened in their lives, I've kind of been there. You've been part of it, yeah, yeah in some way or another. And now they both teach at our auction school. Oh wow! And, uh, that so that. they're like family, you know. They're like family. But anyway, he got into this hella hunter thing, and uh, I remember when he got his when he was taking his helicopter. Uh, you know, he was you know he was doing all the practicing and the testing and trying to get qualified and certified to be a helicopter. And he goes, he calls me captain, and he said, Captain, he said, you ready to go up in the helicopter? And I said. Uh, no. <laughs> so I, I have not flown not with him. No, I just, I'm just, I'm a watcher. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but he's had everybody from, um, uh, oh, he's, uh, what, uh, Ted Nugent. He had yeah. Ted Nugent up hunting with him. And so he, they have, I'm telling you that it's a pretty impressive thing. And when you think about, and, and you can quote the numbers here, they do how much, uh, feral hogs do, how much damage it, to it's, the, t- it's over 500 million. 500 just million. Just in our state, just our state alone. So Each year. how are we doing with the battle? Well, we're you know we're, we're we still need more tools. You know, it's that they, they we have to maintain. We have to, we have to eliminate sixty percent of them just to maintain the current population. How are we the doing? Pop, population. So we're, it, it's they're, they're getting worse. They're getting worse. We need some more tools. We need some selective baits, which we're almost there uh, on that. Uh, we just need more tools. We we can just trap and shoot so many of them. So when you when you shoot them. Or whatever you do to eradicate them, what happens to the meat? Do they do they? Well, uh, a lot, lot, lot of the times, that, like our friend Ted Nugent, who's actually my campaign chairman and campaign treasurer, right? Uh, uh, set up a a, a program. Uh, oh, I forget the name of it. Uh, Hunters for the homeless or something like that. I got it. Uh, and I think, uh, well, in, in fact, I know what you're talking about. Anyway, so and, we, and Craig's in, Craig is involved in and that. And he knows about it. And, and so, so they, they, they we take them, process yep. them, and donate them to homeless shelters. Yep, is where, that's right. Where they go. And it's, hey, it's great. That's a great program. Organic, completely organic, fresh, wild caught, you know, wild boar meat. It's good. So uh, that's where a lot of it goes. Uh, some of them, you know, they remain on the ranch and the the buzzards and everything, you know, consume them and yeah. actually they the other hogs eat the hogs. I yeah, mean, it's, it's kind of crazy. Pretty, isn't pretty it? crazy. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> well, I lived on a dairy about an hour north of here, outside of Gainesville, 
And, you know, when you tell somebody that you lived on a farm back in the 60s and you, you tell them what all you used to shoot and what all you used to eat, you know, a lot of times they'll go, oh, my God, y'all yeah. ate those? And I go, well, yeah. You sure, know, why not? It was on the – Squirrel pie, right? Uh, yeah. A lot of squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> squirrels and rabbits and – Oh, yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. Um, and, of course – and we woke up every morning and uh, listening to Paul Harvey News. If you didn't listen to Paul Harvey News, oh, yeah. you didn't live on a farm or a ranch anywhere right. in Texas, you know. So, all right. So we go through. Uh, this is really funny. I was going to ask you one of the questions I had. Uh, sum up what the Texas Agriculture Commissioner does besides have your name on every gas pump in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, we may have to have another show for that. We. <laughs> We, we do a lot of stuff, but no one really knows what we do. Mike. Well, that's, and that's what uh, I really want to get to, because people need to understand what the Ag Commissioner does. We, uh, we have over 130 statutory functions by law that my agencies perform. My agency is a $6 billion agency, which mm -hmm. doesn't really ring home to anybody. But if I told you that my budget is larger than the budget of 31 governors, that kind of drives it home. Yep. So we're a large agency. Well, we are a country. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So... <laughs> uh, People might not know it, but I'm responsible for five million school meals each day. We run all the nutritional programs for the state and federal government here mm -hmm. in Texas. School lunch, school breakfast. We do help with meals on wheels, summer feeding programs, uh, evening programs, adult feeding programs. Uh, we work with area food banks, et cetera, a lot, a lot of grants and distribution through that. We run the commodity warehouses. So like when Hurricane Harvey hits, I'm run, responsible for getting all the food to the you know, emergency shelters and things like that. So most people don't know that. We are also the consumer protection division for the state of Texas. We make sure that consumers aren't getting ripped off. You had mentioned uh, fuel pumps. So mm -hmm. we do uh, weights and measures is the, that division. So right. anything so by weight, length, height, you know, yep. volume, uh, we, we oversee that. Cardwood. When, Gas when, pumps, scales. When I was it. when I was a kid, <clears throat> probably around eighteen, nineteen years old, uh, my grandfather, um, well, he had built refineries uh, during World War II, and then they they started a, a they had an oil company north of here called Burke Royalty, and they uh, and he was just kind of a part of it. He's probably an employee or something, but then as time went on, he got into um, installing um, service stations. Oh, okay. And the fuel pumps. And so I, I literally had a, a license with weights and measures. Oh, really? Yeah, wow. because we would uh, install all the piping, and then we'd test all the pumps, and then we'd repair the pumps. Wow. And, re and when I was 19, 20 years old, I was repairing gasoline nozzles. Wow. And we'd have to test those things. And I'd, I would go down to Austin. We'd drop off our cans, yep. and they would uh, they would test them out and make sure that they were metered out. Then I remember running all over the country with these cans, these these gas cans. A lot of people don't even know what I'm talking about. Oh, but, but you it, had to get certified from the Department of Ag. I had to have a license. Yeah. And at 18, 19, I was certified by Texas by uh, – I don't remember who – well, I, I have no idea now who the uh, the ag commissioner was at that time. But I, John C. White would be my guess. That sounds about he right. He was there like 26 years. Yeah. So, yeah, a long yeah. time. I, it's just really interesting because your, your work crosses over so many boundaries. People, you know, I was thinking about it. You're like, um, I guess if you look at the uh, – the order, the structure of uh, the governor, the lieutenant governor, you know, the, the uh, secretary of state. When you get go down, you're like the number four or five am, most – right. literally right. most yeah. important elected official in the state of Texas. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on because I, I think that's a story that should be told. People need to understand. I was reading some information about you, and, and uh, you had pushed to give the local um, – um, the local school districts the the right to do their their own uh food agenda that's, I, right. that's the best way i can yeah. put it when you say that yeah when i took over a little over four years ago instead of having healthy kids we had healthy trash cans because all the food was being thrown away it was terrible yeah so we've worked real hard on that and i have a farm to school program farm fresh fridays where we bring in the farmer and let them talk about where the food's grown and i set up a network mike our schools were buying zero local products from our local farmers yeah. and so we set up a network we've got them all connected and last year our schools bought 10 million dollars worth of local fresh product no added salt no preservatives no dyes never flash frozen served fresh to our kiddos so we have about half our schools participating it's not mandatory i don't believe in mandates 
So we have over half our schools participating in that program now, and we're starting to see less and less of that food going in the trash, and those kids are eating it. That's good. That's yeah. real good. Real good. Yeah. Well, I, <clears throat> it's really funny when you start talking about regulations, and you know, a lot of people don't realize that for over 20 years, almost 25 years, I sold all the surplus for the Dallas Independent School District, wow. and I had that uh, contract and, and finally gave it to my partner, and then he, he decided he didn't want to do it anymore. But um, – but I, you, when you're inside of a system, you certainly do get an eyeful of yeah. what's waste and what's what's not, and and what's right and what's not right. And that's that's taxpayer dollars going in the trash. Well, I'm looking at yeah. my dollars. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and you know it's uh, it's all about tax dollars. Right. And uh, but then when you look at the crossover too, though, with the homeland security, and we're going to talk about the uh, the border. Uh, okay. I, that's a pretty passionate thing to, that I'd like to talk about today. So you uh, you served uh, your first term, then you decide you want to do it again. I actually served six terms. Six in terms. In Texas House. Yes, yeah, sir. in the House. In the House. And then you got. Then and then you, we ran for Ag Coach Commissioner, successful on that. Right. Crowded field, but we, we prevailed. Uh, I got in late, and uh, there was already four or five of them running. Uh, but when I announced that Ted Nugent was my campaign treasurer, I went and shot right to the top <laughs> and and never left that spot. Can't we, scratch we fever right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he is something else. I, I was in the Minneapolis airport years ago, and, and uh, you, you can't miss him. Oh, no. Uh, I mean – it's like, I think that was I, I think that was Ted Nugent, and then it was like, well, of course that was Ted Nugent. Absolutely. Well, you got name identity. He's, on he's that a great one. rancher. Has a ranch here in Texas. He's a th he considers himself a Texan. He still has property in, in, in Michigan, but yeah. uh, uh, has a really nice place in Valley Mills. Really. Just outside of Waco. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, that that's pretty cool. So you, and then uh, so your first term was up as as ag commissioner. Just recently got reelected, yep. along with all the other statewide, you know, Abbott and the rest of us all ran. And How hard did you have to work this time? You know, I just go wide open. I don't know any other mm -hmm. way to go. So you know, we campaign real hard. Most of my campaign is social media based and uh, shoe leather and, and uh, you know, where the rubber meets the road. Yep. Somewhere every day, four or five places a day. Uh, just like I am today. We just, you know, I just I go pretty hard. Well, I mean, we had... We literally are, you know, we're we're doing this show today, and and you and I've been trying. I, I've been working with your your folks in Austin right. to, to to make this work, and I was very excited to have you on. I re, I Thank really you. am, and I, I appreciate the work that you do, because um, you know sometimes the word politician uh, yeah. is a dirty word, and and I I go to Washington and I I lobby for the auctioneers and and the real estate profession and. Uh, uh, and, and it's an ongoing battle all the time. You know, there, there, there's somebody trying to put you out of business oh, yeah. all the time. And we live in a different world. You know, the world you and I grew up in, because we're pretty close to the same age, it's just not the same anymore. And on that subject, I want to talk about credit card skimmers. Okay. Tell me about that. Well, of course, you'd mentioned that, you know, my name's on every fuel pump in the state, 400,000 of them. Yep. We have a kind of a new phenomenon, and, and it's uh, identity theft. And these guys put a, a device in called a credit card skimmer inside the pump or attach it to the outside of the pump. And they steal your credit card information. And then all of a sudden you get a notice that your card's compromised. Of course, mm -hmm. it always happens on a Friday, you know, <laughs> when you can't get another get until Tuesday of, of next week. Of course. Uh, but it's not just credit cards. It, it's, it's also debit cards, which is a huge problem. So I've taken it on myself. There's no other state agency addressing that. So we're taking on – we have a uh, – all my technicians now are, are trained in uh, credit card skimmer protection. So we, we go in and we're catching a lot of them, a lot of them. But we work with the lo local police departments, the sheriff's department, actually Secret Service. We're involved with them. Yeah. It's it's uh, organized crime. It's for the most part Cuban mafia. There's a few Russian mafia involved. Wow. But it's mainly the Cub uh, Cuban nationals uh, that are. It's an organized crime ring. Is what it is. Wow. I didn't know where the, it was originating. I know you've done a video about it. Uh, I don't did. know if you've done more than one, but I, I know that you've done there some is a, video. On YouTube, there's a real good uh, instructional video how to keep from getting your credit card skimmed. I would suggest if you haven't seen that, watch it because what do they where do they what do they type in? Just a Sid Miller skim, uh, credit card skimmer. Okay. It, it, it'll come up. Uh, one of the best ways to check is with your phone. Yep. These skimmers are. Uh, 
a Bluetooth equipped, so you can just, before you fill up, go to settings on your phone, hit Bluetooth. If you see something really unusual, like a long string of numbers or letters, that's a credit card skimmer. Don't fill up at that pump. Call me, and I'll send somebody out, and we'll open the pumps and see if we can find what's going on. Yeah, and I'm going to – we will um, definitely have you give your information at the end of the show and how, how they can get a hold of your office and, sure. and you know, how to how to talk about it. Uh, I had ju- ironically, I had just literally watched <laughs> yesterday um, or night before last uh, – it was a, a feature on skimming. In fact, a friend of mine, uh, Wayne Thorne from Alabama, he's a he's an auctioneer and a ringman that works with me, and uh, we've known each other for 30, 40 years, and he, he sent me uh, a video about this skimming, and he was showing some things you can do. I thought it was interesting. They, they were showing people that were that where you put your credit card in, you could actually kind of grab it and shake it or try to pull it off and and sometimes they'll just come right off right. because they, they stick them on there and and they know it's it may be short learned and lived but um you can't you're not going to hurt the pump no because no. those things because i used to install them of course back in the old days when we first started installing pumps they were they were not digital i was right. on the front end of the digital stuff All mechanical oh yeah. my gosh you talk about oh, yeah. uh, nightmares like trying to repair a, a clock a, a, a watch and it was all, you know, uh, yeah. the kids today don't even know what we're talking about. And when they first came out with the digital stuff, I'm going, holy guacamole, this is going to be a monster. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm not a technical right. guy. And, yeah. and it was just like, oh, maybe we ought to just work harder on this auction thing. <laughs> so that's how that worked out. Uh, now I'm going to talk about some controversial stuff. And, uh, and you and I, uh, you and I uh, we text back and forth. We visit. Sure. Uh, quite a bit uh, through social media and, and messenger and stuff and and which I, I talked to a lot of people you know uh, in, in Washington some of the congressional members and the senators and we were talking about the fact I'm gonna be up there you're, you're going back and forth uh, right uh, covering us and uh, I go up there and and, uh, and Senator Cornyn is a, an acquaintance and um, Senator Cruz I'm gonna talk about a little bit of that I'm gonna talk about mr. Beto sure. Uh, here in a minute but one of the one of the subjects that you brought attention to and i'm gonna i want to talk about this because it's happening here in in um, in dallas you know we've been seeing the confederate monuments uh being removed uh from virginia uh to texas uh, oh, yeah. and we saw uh, lee park robert e lee park here in dallas they they took uh, robert e lee's uh statue down and put it in storage somewhere and and we're kind of suspended on what they're going to do or how they're going to rename it. They're going to do something. Yeah. They've already renamed most of the schools in Dallas that were uh, of any ancestry to the Confederacy. Uh, I, I lived, I grew up in a town north of here in Gainesville. And what people don't understand is, you know, that's just our history. That is the history. Yeah. And, uh, I, I have a hard time with it because you know we we still have our Confederate monuments on the on the courthouse square. I was raised in that town, and uh, nothing about that statue ever uh, made me want to become a Confederate. Uh, it's just it's our legacy, it's our history. Every street around that courthouse is named after a Confederate soldier, oh, yeah. uh, or someone that was in in the, And I just don't understand why we want to um, lose our history. Uh, it's not it's not necessarily an affirmation of uh, the the thought for me it was never about slavery it was about economics and that, and people don't under, understand there were probably uh, there were probably as many slave owners in in uh, the north as there was in the south it's just when it became uh, an economic issue you know the north needed the support of the economics of the south that's what really brought the thing to to, to, to wow. really a, a boiling point and we could you know we could debate it but now they've announced in the last week and a half uh, they're going to go into a uh, a cemetery which you know, my personal feeling is a, a cemetery is a sacred place and now they're going to remove the Confederate uh, statues, which it's it's a complex. I mean, it's a, but it's a complex situation, and uh, they're going to spend five hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand mm. dollars to remove, and they don't know what they're going to do with them. They just know we're going to take them down because we're going to follow the the edict uh, of New Orleans and places like that. Now, they call that pioneer pioneer cemetery, right? 
Well, there's a reason why they call it Pioneer Cemetery. We have the first mayors of Dallas are buried there. Uh, it's history. Uh, I know that you had supported um, a license plate. Uh, I do. Yes. Right. Tell me about that. Well, the Sons of Confederate Veterans wanted a specialty license plate several years ago, and they had the, the rebel flag, not the Confederate flag, but the, the rebel flag. Right. Uh, which has some, you know. Uh, Similarities. Uh, you know, racial overtones. That's, yeah. that's been used by some, some skinheads and things. Yeah. So the text doc commissioners turned them down. They said, it's just too controversial. We're not giving you a license plate. Well, they came to me, and this was just more recently, but it's, it's been several years since they tried, and they had a new plate design. They said, would you – and you can get a plate if you get a state agency to sponsor you. So they had to have a sponsor. I said, well, let me see it. Let's see what you've got. And they simply had the Texas flag, and they had a, a soldier dressed in a gray uniform there holding the Texas – I said, I don't think that's going to offend anybody. I mean, if that offends somebody, you're trying to be offended, I guess, because yep. – you know, that's, and it was, uh, I said, sure, I'll sponsor it. Well, TxDOT turned them down again. They yeah. said it was too too controversial. You know, the Lone Star flag is considered a Confederate flag. Yeah. So, it, I mean, it is. I mean, sure. that was the Texas Regiment flag was the Lone Star flag. So, anyway, they got turned down. So, I don't know if they'll try again or not, but uh, uh, I, I get very perturbed about trying to change our history and taking these statues down and, and mm -hmm. renaming streets and schools. I mean, uh the only way we're going to learn from history is, is have it before us. That's right. So I, I wrote a, a long opinion piece. What really sh throwed me over the brink is when Six Flags Over Texas, yep. right down the road here, yep. decided to take the six flags that flew over Texas down and, yep. and just have six flags, I guess. It was just, it was so, just six – yeah, what, the, it was just six U.S. flags. It was it, 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 with the six flags that had flown over Texas. Oh, so I remember Spain, I grew, I grew, Mexico. I grew yeah, up. Yeah, uh, and, uh, and, the Confederacy, the Lone Star State, United States flag, and France. Right. So that's the six. So anyway, so that's where I kind of got involved and, and started, you know, speaking my mind. And I immediately bought six flags that flew over Texas, and they're up in the Texas Department of Agriculture. <laughs> if you want to come by and see them, I've got them on display. <laughs> Well, you in know, my office. you know, it just kind of blows my mind because you, you, you we have a specific history in the state. Yeah. Um, and I just um, I have a hard time, you know, and I've told people before, if, if I hadn't been in the auction business and done all the different things I've done, I'd, I originally thought I was going to end up being a basketball coach and a history teacher Oh wow! because I, I loved history. And then when you just, you know. We're seeing this. We've seen the same thing done by ISIS. They've gone into all these places, and they've torn down the buildings and the museums, and they've burned the art, and they've they've literally yeah. uh, beat it with with uh, with hammers and all that stuff. And we're seeing some of the same stuff in the United States. And I just think it's wrong. And and I'm not defending anything about what happened during the Civil War. That's not it. No, you I know, don't. it's um, it's just a shame to see us go to these levels. And some of it is relatively radicals that, that want to change the face of the country. We, we can learn a lot from history. If, if we don't, we repeat history. I mean, that's, that's right. kind of the, the mantra. We're that's, my, at... uh, that's my rant for the moment. Okay. <laughs> you probably knew that was coming. Um, so, Greg Abbott. Um, Governor Abbott ran on a uh, platform of less government. Um, less regulation uh, which now I'm I'm getting in full force on right now because previously when you helped us with legislation and it was to improve uh, our regulations over auctioneering and and I believe that you know when you have a multi-billion dollar industry like the auctioneers look if I if you're if, if you passed away now I'm not promoting anything okay. but if something happened to you next week and Deborah called me and said Mike would you come out and, and handle the estate or hand, sell some stuff for us, you would want to know that she was protected sure. financially, whether it's through bonding or just r regulations where other people can keep an eye on what you do to make sure you do it right and do it and do it in fairness to the family. Sure. It's a big deal. Um, and right now, there that you know someone has entered in uh, a, a, a potential bill to do away with licensing for auctioneers. It's going to be controversial. And, and I'm going to be in Austin because that's what I do. Yeah. And uh, it's unnecessary. Uh, you know, we passed uh, a few years ago uh, a bill that um, 
uh, required uh, if you're going to be an online auctioneer you're going to be regulated just like a non-online sure. because auctioneers if you're if it's an auction it's an auction and that was my point in in the legislation if it's not an auction then don't call it an auction but if it's if it's got the word auction in it and you're going to use what i've created over the last 40 years of running a reputable auction company then i think you ought to be regulated too it's sure. only fair well you know, we could not, we couldn't seem to get, uh, we, we got the bill passed overwhelmingly, went right. into immediate act and uh, like within 30 days or something. And uh, nobody argued against it. Right. Texas Department of License Regulation didn't argue right. against it. Everybody was on the same page until two or three of the big auction companies decided to come in and say, we don't want to be regulated. And then uh, it's amazing how you get a stalemate in Austin and then the regulatory agency decides, you know what, we're not going to do anything about this. We're just not going to do you know, it. You know, that's a shame. And that's that's what we do. We're part of the consumer protection. And the auction laws are to protect the consumer. Right. From getting ripped off by unscrupulous actors. You know, unfortunately, the, you know, the other 98% has to comply with them to protect us from the 2 or 3% bad actors. Sure. And that's true any profession. Sure. And so that's that's why they're there. It's it's to protect us from bad actors. Got to be licensed to be a doctor. Absolutely. Got to be licensed to be an attorney. Real estate, and I tell you, real estate's a big part of our business. I mean, a huge oh, part of our business. So anyway, uh, I'm just kind of bringing that up. Um, uh, I appreciate. Our, we, we need to keep those consumer protections in place. I agree. I mean, I we, agree. I'm I'm not a big government guy, and I'm not for over regulations. But we do need some regulations to protect Oversight. the consumer sure so do. they don't get ripped off. Yeah. Well, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. And there's a reason why in the federal bankruptcy courts, they require anywhere up to half a million to a million dollar bond for an auctioneer to, right. to, to work for them. Yeah. And see, we don't have that protection, you know. So anyway, that's something that you and I'll probably talk um, on a sidebar. So this is kind of a, a weird question for you. But so when, when Sid Miller's sitting in his office, and and he needs advice on an issue who's his go-to person who do you who's your mentor or who, who's somebody you look up to for guidance because um, we all have somebody i tell you it's, it's pretty easy for me and i learned this when i started in the legislature i sat on the north side of, of the house chamber and it's up on the second floor and most of those decisions were black and white. I mean, I knew if I was for it or I was against it. But every once in a while, Mike, there's one of those gray ones. What I would do is I would go over and I would open the shutters. There's a window sill and I'd sit. And there's a lot of monuments on our Capitol ground. But right outside that window by my desk was a monument of the Ten Commandments. And I would look at that monument. I'd say, mm-hmm. Where does this bill fit in that list of laws? Wow. And without fail, God would give me the guidance what I needed to do. I mean, it would come real clear to me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I look to the scripture for guidance when it comes to those gray areas where I just really don't have a black and white decision on it. So, yep. and I pray about it. So that's where I get my guidance. That's, that's cool. That's, that's a great answer, too. Thank you. You know, um, you should be commended for that. Um, who are kind of some of the people that you, that you are, say, better friends with, that you kind of uh, commune with when you're in Austin, people that you would consider friends? Who would we talk to? Well, we have, have a lot of those. Of course, a lot of f former legislators, some that are, that are still in office. Of course, my executive staff, I have full confidence in them. I have four assistant commissioners. I have a general counsel who I served with in the legislature. I have a deputy commissioner. So those are the people that I surround me. I've tried to hire people that are smarter than me and tell me what I need to do. And and that's why the agency is, we've revamped it, retooled it. It's running much more efficient. Uh, we're, you know, we're a lot better with our dollars. We've cut out regulation, rollback mandates. and uh, But that's just the kind of people and I pay my people really good. And I got criticized for the amount I pay my people. But the way you do that is you run it like a business. So when I took over, I said, how much are we paying total for our administrative staff? They yep. said, well, it's this much. I said, how many people have we got? They said, we got 16. 
I said, I can't hire the kind of people that I want to hire for that kind of money. I said, but I've got to have really good people in here. I said, if I just hire nine, how, how much can I pay them? Oh, you can pay them really good if you just, I said, well, good. So I'm actually paying less for my administrative staff overall, but my administrators are making more money than the previous ones. Does that make sense? Well, I, I read all about so, it. So, yeah. yeah I, didn't, I didn't go there, Yeah, uh, but... but, but it was one so of the I was, able, I was able to go get some really, really good people. Yeah, you were criticized uh, yeah. big time uh, for seeking more funds and, yeah. and for wanting to raise fees and things of that nature. Sure. You got hammered about that. But you know what? Uh, sometimes you just got to do what you, you have to do to make it work. And, and do, do what's right. Well, we all do that. Yeah. You know, I mean, we run a, a we run a seven, eight billion dollar company down the hallway from wow. here. And and we try to hire the best and the brightest, and I'd rather have one than three, and Absolutely. because they'll they'll make sure we get the work done, Absolutely. and if give them a few assistants, and they yeah. can do a lot. So I, I think that's cool. Um, so 2016 rolls around, and we have an interesting presidential candidate, and uh, I actually uh, have have met Mr. Trump a few times, and and uh, know some of his are friends with some of his business associates out in New York and and uh, various states and and when he was running I I met him uh, in Wisconsin and and I've had a few discussions and so I would say uh, you are a um, have been a staunch supporter of uh, President Trump uh, you've rallied with him uh, you've traveled with him and uh, tell me about this this last uh, this last visit that he had well you know I was one of the Few statewide, actually, few. I was the only statewide that was supporting Trump back when he was running for the presidency. I mean, everybody else thought he had kryptonite in his pocket or something. I don't know <laughs> what the problem was, but you know, I'll just use a little cowboy logic, Mike. I thought, you know, Donald Trump on his worst day, and if you'll remember, he had some bad days back then. Yeah, uh, it's still better than Hillary Clinton. So I'm, I'm all in. I'm doing whatever I can to get him, get him elected. And uh, you know, I went on Fox News and all the things, and and uh, he appreciated that. You know, me standing up for him because mm -hmm. they said he was his, the election was going to be close here in Texas, and I was telling them they were all wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't going to be close. Right. So most recently, uh, I got a call from the White House, and they wanted me to come to El Paso to the rally and meet the president at the airport on Air Force One and ride with him to to the event, which I did, and uh, it was a it was a good. Uh, uh, discussion we had in, in, in the Beast. They call it the Beast, the Cadillac, you know, that's yeah. armored Cadillac. Yeah. It's quite a vehicle, by the way. That's another story. It's like an es what is it, an Escalade or something? No, it's it's a it's a it's, stretched uh, it's a stretch. Cadillac. Oh, yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So. Well, I've seen pictures of it. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty pretty neat. Yeah. The, the funniest thing that happened, I forgot to turn my phone off. I'm sitting closer than me and you're sitting, and my ringtone is the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, from the Clint Eastwood movie. <laughs> yeah. It goes off and he just slaps me on the leg and said, the good, the bad, that's the best move Western ever made. Clint Eastwood. Boy, he's not looking so good now. I saw him at Pebble Beach the other day. He's just, <laughs> I said, Mr. President, Tombstone is by far the best Western <laughs> ever made. He said, Tombstone? I said, yeah, you know, Val Kilmer, Doc Holliday, Johnny Ringo, Virgil <laughs> White Earp, the OK Corral. That's the best one ever made. He goes, wow, Tombstone? Not the good, the bad, the ugly. I couldn't believe it. I was arguing with the prince then. <laughs> uh, well, see, if I'd have been sitting over there, I'd start talking about John Wayne. There you go. <laughs> uh, so there was some rumors <clears throat> of a possibility that um, you could join the cabinet at some point. Well, actually, we came real close. I thought you did. Uh, I got a call and said, wouldn't the president want you to come down here and interview at mar Largo for a cabinet position for the Secretary of Agriculture? I said, we've... We've interviewed four people, but we, we want to interview you too. So I was the last one they interviewed. The other four they interviewed, their, their interviews lasted 15 minutes wow. each. I was in there two and a half hours. So I told Deborah, my wife said, you know, I never really wanted to go to Washington, D.C., but it looks like the president's going to ask us to, you know, come help him. I mean, you don't tell the president no. So if he does, you know, we're going. And I'll just have to resign as the agriculture commissioner, I guess take that cabinet position. So it looked like everything was a go and then hit a little snag. They do a thing called a background check. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the guys come, he said, uh, Commissioner Miller, I, I see here that uh, your camp, is it true that your campaign treasurer and your campaign chairman is Ted Nugent? 
I said, yeah, man, we're like blood brothers. We're like close. Yeah, <laughs> you bet. Yes, sir. He's my man. He said, uh, Commissioner, that one item alone is enough to keep you from getting through the nomination <laughs> process. <laughs> oh. I said, okay, I'm out. And so, so, and so Governor so, Purdue from and Georgia. And he's doing a great job. Yeah. I, I know, Sonny, I'll see him this next week. Uh, he's he's perfect man for the job. That's good. He's doing a good, good job. Well, it's impressive to be in the final two or three. Was, I was honored just to be on the short list. Really, absolutely. It was, yeah. <clears throat> so I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna read this because I wrote this about two or three hours ago, and uh, and then I'm, I want to hear your take. Um, and so people are listening to this now they need to understand. You know, I've got in. I'm a, I'm pretty much a kind of an independent guy. You know, I believe in, in who the person is, who's going to do sure. the best job for me. Uh, I'm a very fiscal conservative, but I, I tend to be open-minded to letting people live their own life. I don't, I don't want to tell people how to live their life. I don't want to. But I have my beliefs, and every once in a while they'll sneak out. Okay? There you go. And I find it interesting, and th this is a note that I wrote uh, this morning. I find it interesting that uh, so much is made of the, uh, the drugs and the human trafficking on the border uh, because that seems to be the big discussion on the wall they always whether it's msnbc or cnn or any of the the, the liberal groups it's always about the drugs and, and don't get me wrong i i, I get it. we know that there's a certain amount that's going to come through my my challenge has been because i do watch this and i do study it and i do want I, I read a lot about um what's going on in other countries we know that in South America right now, and in Central America, it's especially South is extremely um, unstable. Venezuela, et cetera. Um, it, in my opinion, it's my foregone conclusion that as these governments uh, disintegrate or disrupt or get violent, these these refugees are going to continue to move north. That's the answer for them. It's there's nowhere south to go. That's going to be better than what they have now. So as this goes down, of course, and, and President Trump and his administration are dealing with this right now. This is a hot topic it is, on what to do much, with Venezuela. Very much. But as these people, uh, we've already got people from other Central American uh, countries coming north. You know, we hear about these groups, and the president talks about it all the time. Well, the reality is. You have to have a barrier to stop these people, or they're just going to walk in. And you could, can you fortify the border? Yes, you can fortify the border, and you can line up troops, and you can put the National Guard. Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to have to take people in Iowa and post them at the border of the United States to keep people out and keep our the people who own property along the border safe? Because you know it's only going to get bad. It just doesn't make any sense. And, the, and I hear the argument all the time about, well, um, you know, the numbers are down now than the most in, in history. Well, part of that's because we've scared them into staying where they are mm -hmm. and said, don't come because we're going to send you back. But the other thing about this is um, the you have to put a, a stop. You know what's funny? Everybody that doesn't want a, a border or a fence around – uh, the border of Texas or Arizona or California uh, or New Mexico, they're the same people that have a fence around their house sure. uh, from the Vatican on down. Everybody's got protection, but they don't want us to, to protect ourselves. And let me tell you, I don't care if, if, if the numbers are 20 percent of what they were 10 years ago. It only takes one to take down a high rise. That's true. That's it true. only takes a small group of people to disrupt everything we have in this country. And I want to I'll be interested to see how many of those people that are standing, screaming, and yelling about a border are going to be going, uh, you know, well, that's terrible in Los Angeles when when we have Century City go down. Yeah. Because it's going to happen, Sid, because th you can't protect forever. Something There's Something's always going to be a ca catastrophic thing happen. Oklahoma City happened. Right. Of course, that was in this country. But you're going to have natural things happen because of people. So what, crazy people. Tell me, tell me your, tell me your take. Well, I had this very conversation with the president, and I, I started out. I said, Mr. President, I think you really need to take it to the Democrats, because they're, what they're saying is your wall is immoral. He said, Well, what do you mean? I said, Let me tell you what's immoral. What's immoral is giving these people false hope. They're herded up here thousands of miles like cattle. 
they get here. The women and children are abused or raped. The young men are recruited into MS-13 gangs. The rest of them are made into drug mules to carry dope, smuggled across the river. I said, when things go bad, they're left to die in the desert. I said, I've seen them. I was chairman of Homeland Security. I've seen those bodies out there. I know what's happening to those people. I said, you, if you want to do a humanitarian act, one of the greatest humanitarian acts you can do is build that wall. The most, uh, you know, humane thing you can do is, is build the wall. The most morally correct thing is build that wall and funnel that immigration to legal ports of entries. I said, this is a humanitarian effort. It's just shame. It's a travesty what are happening to those people. And they pay tens of thousands of dollars for the privilege to be abused like that. Yeah. And then our farmers and ranchers on our side can't even go on their property. So you talk about the real estate values. There is none. You can't sell it for any price if it's got cartel traffic back and forth. Who wants that? Nobody. Yep. And I said, you know, they can't farm. They, their fences are cut. Their houses are ransacked. Their cattle are scattered or killed and, and are stolen. He mm -hmm. said, I said, it's really bad. I yep. said, we've got to secure the border. Yeah. He said, I like it. I'm going to use that. And he did that night in his speech. Yeah. He, well, he he's in, he's intuitive and he understands. I mean, look, he speaks to the people. Like he, he's you know, the worst filter uh, I've ever seen on any politician. But you know what? It's it's resonated with the people because the people are fed up with with uh, what's going on in, in Washington and, and not just Washington. It, it's it's in the state houses, too. You know, the, the people, the average working man and woman who has paid in their taxes and are worried about their Social Security, they're fed up that we're tired of hearing about investments in other countries that's that's the that's the right. nut right there there people like me are sick of hearing about rebuilding afghanistan we're i'm not worried about fixing syria i'm not concerned about those countries i'm sorry that they've got problems but we've spent billions and trillions of dollars working on countries and then they turn right around and go right back to the same thing that it was before so i'm i'm just like everybody else i'm a, i'm a frustrated american that says enough's enough now if, if somebody comes along that's better than donald trump and 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 gets it like he has i'm going to support somebody like that because you know um that's that's the way it is um so what do you think about beto well i think I kind of think and I hope that he's kind of a flash in the pan. Uh, he had a great organization together. He energized. There was almost, there was more than twice as many Democrats turned out for this last election than they did four years ago. Yep. So he energized the base. They registered a lot of new voters, a lot of millennials he reached out to. Willie Nelson had a concert for him there in Austin. Yep. They registered 40,000 new voters it, just at that concert. Wow. So. That's that's kind of the new phenomenon. I think that's the new Democrat. They're, they're socialist. You know, you you got others like him. Uh, I predict 2020, the Democrats are going to nominate some left winger, you know, uh, Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, and that's just not going to play well here in Texas. Yeah, uh, I think Trump will win by a much larger margin. I think he'll win re-election, but I think he'll increase his margin here in Texas. And I think the Beto thing will be over with. Okay. Well, he's. Uh, and I, I saw that in El Paso, by the way. We yep. had like thirty thousand there for the for the Trump rally, and maybe five hundred for the for the Beto rally. Yeah. So I think his I think his lights dimming. I was watching his rally. Um, I, I, I saw both, you know, and the the Trump was pretty wild. I mean, it was big, and then I I noticed that. Uh, of course, especially the more liberal media, I noticed they, they love to uh, suck up close to the stage where it looks like there's a lot of people there. But if you pull back, there wasn't a lot of people there. And, I, and, and I'm not knocking Beto. He's not, you know, he's, he, for me watching, he was kind of flavor of the month. He reminded me of a, of a Robert Kennedy type. You know, he kind of has that Kennedy-esque look. And we're in a different time. You know, Bernie announces and, you know, he raises $6 million in a day yesterday. Right. And, and he's going to have a lot of money behind him. But I, I don't know how long that, uh, you know, he's no kid. You know, right. Uh, so, and Trump said yesterday, you know, he thought his better days were were behind him. Probably. And and so yeah. I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I've never seen so many people wanting to run for these offices. This is that's the, it's happening in Dallas with nine people running for the mayor's position, and then you look at how many Democrats are coming out. It's going to be an interesting pool. It's going to be a real interesting I, I, pool. I think you can attribute that to our president. I think he shined a light on the 
on elected office that 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 anybody's got a chance right yeah i think you're right you're involved with the cowboy church i am yeah and um you're an elder in the church I am. how long have you been involved with cowboy church uh we started uh my wife and i and another couple and a pastor the five of us started that in 2004 and uh we're still going strong we own some property now and built built our own church we rented and hopped around from the sale barn to different places for That's a while cool. yeah uh but it's doing very well uh we'll run seven eight hundred on a on a sunday we'll run you know 1500 to 2000 on easter wow. wow so we have to have you know a couple of services to, mm -hmm. to get everybody in and uh, we're really not uh robbing anybody's sheep from different flocks these are yeah. people that are most for the most part unchurched or maybe they had a bad experience years ago and and maybe they just don't feel comfortable going to first church or you know yep. dressing up and i'm almost overdressed to go to cowboy church right now yeah you know, come in your blue jeans and oh, boots yeah. or t-shirt or you know whatever yeah cowboy church is is uh <laughs> it's close to my heart i have a lot of friends that that are in the cowboy church and uh in fact one of our international champion auctioneers up in uh uh, near Welch, Venita, Oklahoma. Uh, Greg Highsmith, who's a big auctioneer with Ritchie Brothers, uh, he he he's uh, very involved in the church up there, and and they've kind of. I'm not going to say he started it because I don't know who started it, but I just know he's embraced it and their family is very active in the Cowboy Church. You know, there was a a, a group years ago called the Fellowship of. Uh, uh, you had the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, right, and remember. then the Fellowship. Uh, then there became the Fellowship of of, uh, of Cowboys. And which is a kind of an offshoot of the Cowboy Church. Well, we had a, some friends of ours out in uh, Buffalo, Texas. Uh, not Buffalo, Texas. Buffalo Gap. You know where oh, Buffalo, yeah, Buffalo Gap, Gap is. Sure. So anyway, uh, Charles and Chatty Cass were from out there. And I remember back in the 90s, they came to a Texas auctioneers meeting. And they said, we'd like to start the uh, Fellowship of Texas Auctioneers. And, and we said, well. And, and they presented it to us. And they said, it's kind of patterned after the Cowboy Church. And so we voted on it, and we said yes, we'll we'll endorse that. And so then, a few years later, they came back. And they said we'd like to we'd like to take it to the National Auctioneers Association, and I was on that board at oh, that wonderful. time. That's great. And so they they created the uh, fellowship, uh, the International Fellowship of, of Christian Auctioneers, and so we still support and endorse that organization. And uh, um, what whatever denomination you happen to be, it's it's really more about fellowship and and having those connections and and uh, we also uh, provide packages and and send a lot of things to our troops. Uh, that's Perfect. some of the things that we do with that organization uh, that we work it out of Waco, uh, the Waco area, Hillsboro, and uh, down towards Austin. But um, it, it's it's a neat way to support a lot of different people and then when somebody needs prayer or they need uplifting uh we we have a network that, that we work um a couple of more things and then we're going to wrap this thing up because i know you've got to get to fort worth and then go down to the stock yeah. stockyards um you've you've done some rodeoing and stuff like that tell me just a little brief summation of your of your um your rodeo work well you know something i've just grew up with all my life i've never really quit i've had to have my body rebuilt. I've got new knees, hips, and shoulders, so <laughs> bionic, I, yeah, bionic I'm, I'm good to go. I, I participated in Fort Worth recently, and uh, I'll, the March the fifth, I'll be participating in Houston. I'll be uh, roping down there, so yep. still active. You know, I don't play golf, and I don't have a bass boat, so this, or I don't have a Harley Davidson. So that's your therapy. That, that's my therapy. Mm -hmm. Is, is uh, that saddle seat time, which I, which I really enjoy, and I enjoy. Of course, I raise them, I train them myself, and 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 the compete. On horses that I've actually raised on the ranch, and I know your so, son competed. With a my lot. son did really well. He in Fort Worth had a chance to win seven first place, and he won seven first place. I mean, he was congratulations, he did really well. That he was did awesome. A good job. Very good. Well, Sid Miller, you've got a great story. You're um, you're 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 quite the Texan. Well, thank thank you for having us on. I'm One thing I was going to tell you when you're talking about the Cowboy Church, and I forgot. Yeah. I think I may be the only state agency that has has implemented a chaplaincy program in in my uh, department. Mm -hmm. So we have that. We have weekly uh, Bible study during lunch on their own time. No one's required to go. Yeah. Uh, but I've had a great response uh, from our employees on that. They've really appreciated. It. Well, our fellowship group with the auctioneers, we have chaplains in every state. That's perfect. Either state or or region. I figured you might. Yeah, yeah. we do, and it, it's gone over very very well. Um, Sid Miller, Texas Agriculture Commissioner, thank you for being uh, my friend. 
thank you for being here and making time for all the folks that are going to see this uh, basically all over the world and and we hope you'll promote the show and and uh, we've certainly right. enjoyed having you and look forward to watching you the next few years because I kind of feel like you're one of those guys and you're going to be hard to keep settled down and uh, <laughs> things are going to keep opportunities are going to keep coming and you're going to keep stepping up to the plate and doing what needs to happen well, thank you Mike it's good to be with you again good to see you again and let's let's stay in touch let's do it all, all right. right thank you very much Sid Miller Texas Agriculture Commissioner here in Texas uh, just doing it and uh, staying busy and helping the people of Texas and doing the things that need to be done. So we appreciate all of his hard work. And on behalf of everyone here in Dallas at uh, Lincoln Center with the Mike McGavel Jones Show, we bid you adieu from Dallas, Texas. God bless. We'll see you next time.